So thank you. Um, I get the incredible honor to introduce the Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings today. She's the former Kellner Family Distinguished Professor of Urban Education in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Dr. Ladson Billings is the author of the critically acclaimed book, The Dream Keepers: Successful Teachers of African American Children as well as numerous journal articles and book chapters that have shaped what we know about equity-centered pedagogies. Her work has won numerous scholarly awards, including the Palmero Johnson Outstanding Research Award, the George and Lee Spindler Award from the Council on Anthropology and Education for significant and ongoing contributions to the field of educational anthropology, and is a recipient of the AERA Distinguished Research Award. Dr. Latson Billings is also a fellow of the British Academy, the American Educational Research Association, and the Hagler Institute of Texas A&M University, and is an elected member of the National Academy of Education and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Thank you for being with us here today, Dr. Latson Billings. Uh, thank you, Francesca, and Gloria is just fine. Uh, I'm going to plunge right into sharing my slides because I think I have like 30 minutes and... Um, probably have more like 45 minutes worth of stuff. So I wanna make sure I try to um, make the best use of this time. So let me hit the share screen here. Let's see. Hopefully you are seeing this. Um, and I trust you can see my slides. Tell me if you're seeing the slides or seeing slides and notes. Yes. Okay, perfect. So I've titled the, my uh, remarks, Truths My Teacher Can't Tell Me, uh, Politics of Today's Curriculum. And it starts with a kind of homage to James Lowen's um, critically acclaimed book, Lies My Teacher Told Me. Um, right now we're in a place where our teacher can't tell us the truth. So uh, I want to start by you know, addressing two dangerous trends um, that we are seeing in the curriculum. Number one, banned books, uh, and then linked to that, a whole set of restrictive legislative um, ordinances, laws, um, statutes that are happening across the country. Now, I want to also kind of give you a bit of a backdrop. You know, I used to be a U.S. history teacher, so I'm always going to look historically at things. And that is that banned books have really do have a long history in the U.S. This is not new. I think uh, uh, cited here that our first recorded book ban was in the 1600s in Quincy, Massachusetts, where Thomas Morton published his New England Canaan, which was uh, banned by the Puritan government because it was considered a harsh and heretical critique of Puritan customs and power structure. But in the 1940s, there were a rise of anti-German book bans. And you can understand that we're in the midst of the World, uh, World War, and but we started to see books by German authors taken off the bookshelves. Most book bans in the US have been brought forward by religious groups. And of Typically, they are against things like uh, any discussion of sex or sexuality or evolution or any issues that challenge uh, the orthodoxy of a particular religious perspective. What I think is very dangerous about what we're seeing now is that today's bans are being generated at the governmental level whether it is your school board or your state legislature. So it's not just an individual group saying, we don't want this book in the, in the library. We are seeing um, the people who are elected to uh, handle democratic processes uh, engaged in fostering book bans. And what's interesting, I think, is that the books are banned regardless of their literary merit. So in 1650, you have the banning of the meritorious price of our redemption, which I just referred to because it challenged Puritan ideas. In 1850, it was Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin that was banned. 
1873, you have the passage of the Comstock Act, making it illegal to possess, quote, obscene or, quote, immoral texts. And of course, those what the definition of obscenity and immorality we know is really a kind of local decision. And then throughout the Jim Crow era in the South, there was a banning of books that were unsympathetic uh, uh, to the South's Civil War laws. In some ways, this is important today because you have organizations, as we talked in an earlier sec uh, session, like the Moms for Liberty, who I think are very close in their uh, messaging and their organizational structure to the Daughters of the Confederacy. The discussion of the so-called war of Northern aggression or the idea that even though um, the South lost the war, they won a moral victory, really got promulgated by the Daughters of the Confederacy, that they really took over the narrative. So I want to share with you a very short video that talks about uh, the rise of book bans. What do these three books have in common? Any guesses? They are three of the most commonly challenged and banned books in the United States. A study by the American Library Association found that more than 1,500 books were challenged or banned by schools, libraries, and universities in 2021. Most were written by or about LGBTQIA or Black individuals. For comparison, the association noted just 273 challenges or bans in 2020. Even children's books are coming under attack. They include a book called Anti-Racist Baby uh, by I Ibram Kendi. Do you agree with this book that is being taught with kids that, that babies are racist? It was a symbolic moment of just how much people like Senator Cruz is trying to distract from the real issue or even to demonize materials and books that are actually good for children, helpful for children, allow children to be able to operate in this highly uh, unequal and multiracial world. Book banning in the United States is nothing new. For decades, there have been cries to remove certain books off shelves and out of the classroom. Many book banning efforts historically focused on depictions of slavery, segregation, and racism. One of the most famously banned books, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, was published in 1960. Honors Harper Lee for her outstanding contribution to the great literary tradition of America. It topped the list of most challenged books for years, despite earning a Pulitzer Prize, being adapted into an Oscar-winning film, and being generally regarded as one of the most important novels in a generation. In our courts, all men are created equal. Nowadays, the book is a mainstay in curriculums across the country, but the practice of book banning is finding new life and growing to include both classic novels and newer works. We're in a moment of intense contestation over issues of diversity, inclusion. Let's say you take these books out of the library. What are you gonna do with them? You gonna put them in the street? Light them on fire? What you, where, where are they going? Represent Sexton. I don't have a clue, but I would burn them. What we're seeing is people, politicians tapping into people's frustration, their anxiety about these changes, and pointing to book bans as a kind of rallying cry to say, you know, here's a way that we can push back these tides that we don't agree with. Parents and politicians commonly cite things like profanity, political indoctrination, and sexually and racially explicit language as reasons for wanting a book to be banned. You all are going to hear what our children are hearing in books. And don't stop me. Public school teachers and librarians are at the forefront of this battle. You know, the reason certain stories, like you think Shakespeare, like lasts through the centuries is because there are themes that are just timeless, love, friendship, betrayal, war, death. And so all of these themes are concurrent through the new books now that have seemed to kind of garner the censorship and the ire of certain people. They're thematically still the same at the heart of them. It's just the characters in that story engaging in that theme of love, discovery, self-identification, whatever it might be 
look different. The dangers of censoring books with diverse characters are twofold. These books allow children to see people who look like them, represented in novels, helping them feel less alone. They also provide an opportunity for readers to learn about those who aren't like them, people who come from diverse backgrounds. And then the kind of window aspect is for other people and students to be able to see outside themselves, which I think, you know, kind of builds those bridges, creates more empathy when you can walk a mile in someone else's shoes and understand something from their perspective. That's something that you just can't verbalize in a, a lesson, like you have to walk through a story and a book to get both of those things. The reason why I stood against my, my school district's book ban was because I didn't want future African American kids to go through some of the things I went through growing up. Books that highlight our differences and teach others how to address diversity are crucial. These books shouldn't be up for debate. Books are one of the tools that allow us to be lifelong learners. Of all the things we could be banning, these folks are banning books, but it also demonstrates just the power of books. Books aren't dangerous. At least they're not dangerous to, 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 to those of us who want to create an equitable and just society. What do these... So, as I said, historically book bans have, you know, they have a very long history in the U.S., but what we are seeing now is the rise in the number of book bans. So you can see this incredible jump from 2021 to 2022. And I would say in this year, we've gone into close to 2000 or something like 2200 book bans across the country. And also you see which states have the uh, greatest number of book bans. So of course you see that Texas and Florida are leading the way in the number of uh, book bans that have been put in place. Uh, so the question then becomes, well, what books get banned? Well, we saw To Kill a Mockingbird, of course, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye, um, books that deal with sexuality um, and race tend to be the ones that are being most often challenged and banned in various school districts. Um, so among the books that are banned are books like Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi's Stamp, which is the uh, young adult version of his award-winning book, Kendi's award-winning book called Stamped. Um, Ruby Bridges' book, This Is Your Time, Maya Angelou and Still I Rise, Ta-Nehisi Coates, Between the World and Me, Paul Ortiz, an African-American and Latinx history of the U.S., uh, Mickey Kimball, Kendall's Hood, Hood Feminism and Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give. Uh, all of these books happen to deal with race. There's a whole other set of books that deal with gender and sexuality. Um, so before I sort of switch to this other dangerous trend, I do want to give a shout out and thank you to the Illinois Secretary of State, Alexei Giannakoulis, um, I am. I just gave a talk to the Illinois for the Illinois uh, State Board of Education for the Equity Summit this past week. Um, this is one Secretary of State that isn't just sitting back; he has made it uh, against the law to ban the books. So essentially, it's like, no, we're not going to participate that, in this in the state of Illinois. I think California has done something similar. So it's heartening that there are at least some uh, legislators and some uh, folks in the forefront of the battle who are pushing back um, and not just letting this occur. So the second trend, of course, has to do with the, the legislative trends. Florida's HB7, which was passed last year, is designed to create employer liabilities. In other words, you can have no mandatory diversity trainings uh, if you are an employer. You also, it's also designed to create public school liabilities. So now you have a situation where the students, the parents, and individuals can sue for damages over instructional training that involves certain topics. And it also requires curriculum changes. So it requires um excuse me, prohibits K-12 topics related to discrimination or so-called divisive topics. Now, what's a divisive topic? That is another issue that I think 
uh, is up for discussion. So if we actually get inside of HB7, uh, the so-called Stop Woke Act, on the left, you have some of the, the wording from the act that uh, describes what they're calling woke. So members of one race, color, sex, or national origin are morally superior to members of another race, color, sex, or national origin. They're saying that that's what's being taught. The truth is, U.S. universities, for example, have had a very long history of eugenics, where they taught whites as superior to others. In fact, I uh, just finished reading uh, Malcolm Harris's book, Palo Alto, and he talks about how Stanford was really, they had a required course at Stanford when they were first established called bionomics, which was really just another word for eugenics because they were saying that only certain groups of people were worthy. In fact, back then to get into Stanford, you needed an IQ. You needed a score in the Stanford Binet, uh, 142. And the part that really blew me away is if you were male, you needed to be over six foot, two inches tall. I mean, what is that other than the notion that we're going to create an Uber race, right? Another example of the so-called uh, what they're calling woke is an individual by virtue of his or her race, color, sex, or national origin is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. Now, that's not in any of the work that people who do this uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work does. The truth is that the institution of Negro slavery, as it now exists in the Confederate States, this is a statement from the Constitution of the Confederate States of America, which I often suggest to teachers, don't just teach the U.S. Constitution, teach them this Constitution so that they can see what people were signing on to. What they said was that slavery shall be recognized and protected, uh, that should see uh, word should be by Congress and by the territorial government and the inhabitants of the several Confederate states and territories shall have the right to take us to such territory, any states lawfully held by them in any of the states or territories of the Confederacy. So they were uh, instantiating slavery, saying essentially that people by virtue of their race um, were not entitled to certain things. It goes on to point out that an individual's moral character or status is either privileged or oppressed is necessarily determined by his race, color, sex. That's what they're saying you cannot teach. But what was taught and what we did revere was back in 1784, Thomas Jefferson saying that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. So here we have the so-called founding father who believed in the inherent inferiority of people who were not white. Another point in the white, uh, in the woke column is that the legislation says such virtues as merit, excellence, hard work, fairness, neutrality, objectivity, and racial color blindness are racist and sexist or were created by members of a particular race, color, sex, or no national origin to oppress members of another race, color, sex, or national origin. So that, that's what you cannot teach. But Michael Young back in 1958 said, the idea that people who find wealth and success do so because of personal merit alone are not at all, and not at all because of circumstances inherent in social structures obscures the nuances of American economy, tax law, and income equality. So we know in truth, while you want to say someone is meritorious because they worked hard. We know that the social structures have been in place to ensure success for some groups. And so that's part of Florida's Stop Woke Act. But what about Texas? Well, Texas has passed SB 17 that prohibits all state-funded colleges and universities from establishing or maintaining diversity, equity, and inclusion offices and bans the hiring or assignment of an employee to perform the duties of a DEI office. It also prohibits institutions from soliciting DEI statements from job candidates or giving preference to any applicants on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin. 
and it bans any mandatory diversity training, quote, implemented in reference to race, color, ethnicity, gender, identity, or sexual orientation. So I actually have colleagues uh, and friends at both University of Texas and Texas A&M whose jobs have been eliminated because they were in DEI offices. Of course, we have the very specific case of Professor Kathleen McElroy. You know, she was a tenured professor at the University of Texas and recruited to revive Texas A&M's floundering journalism program. Her offer was changed in midstream from a tenure track appointment to a one year term. Strike against her was that she was a former New York Times editor who was not good enough for a and And I think what happened to P Professor McElroy is eerily reminiscent of what happened to Nicole Hannah-Jones. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, why are Black women always having to take these slings and arrows um, who credentials are of, often better than the very people who seek to hire them? but who are made to uh, feel as though they are not worthy enough to participate in any of these things. I know we like to highlight Texas and Florida, but I just wanted to share with you that this is a national uh, movement and strategy. This is from the, this map is from uh, CRT Forward, which is located at UCLA. You will see in almost every state, there is some activity that is anti-CRT, um, uh, anything related to race. Uh, and so even in California, which we often think of as a sort of our safe haven, while it's not at the state level, um, because the state level ones are colored in blue, uh, and maybe not even at the county level, which have the white or the uh, purple circles at the local school district level. Look at the clump in California, in Southern California, and some part of inland like the Imperial Valley, where you begin to see these different uh, individual school districts who have taken up, or Oregon or Washington. I mean, I think sometimes we think certain places are safe, and this is just something happening in the South, maybe in the Midwest. No, it's happening everywhere. And it comes about because the rest of the world discovers in CRT sometime in September of 2020, when Donald Trump calls it a toxic propaganda that will destroy our country. Now, again, I'm the historian and with an anthropology background, so I'm always looking at context and culture. The context of September 2020 is that this man is behind in the polls in an election and he, he's trying to win. And in some ways, I thought of this as a distraction but it gets blown up by Christopher Rufo, who is out of the Manhattan Institute. And these are two quotes that I took directly from Rufo's uh, Twitter or X or whatever it's now called page, because I wanted to make sure I didn't misquote him. He says, the goal is to have the public read something crazy. I don't know what counts as crazy, but crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. So anytime I read something crazy, I'm supposed to think, critical race theory. He says, we have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural contradictions that are unpopular with Americans. So I don't know who the Americans are that he's referring to, but this is a notion that, okay, we're gonna make sure it's unpopular with them. His second quote is that we've successfully frozen the brand critical race theory into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic. And we, as we put all the various cultural insanities under that brand category. So again, what, what's the cultural insanity? Uh, is LGBTQ cultural insanity? Is DEI cultural insanity? Is social emotional learning a cultural insanity? Because right now, those are things that are all being called critical race theory. Nicole Hannah Jones's uh, 1619 project is not critical race theory, but is often categorized as it because 
this strategy um, that Rufo uh, proposes. Now, the thing is, one person, a Christopher Rufo, can't make this happen. It happens because these campaigns are very well funded. If you look at the political spending that happened in the 2016 election cycle, you would imagine that U.S. Chamber of Commerce would do a lot of political spending because there's a Chamber of Commerce in almost every city across the country. So there's a lot of money to be had. But very quickly under that is crossword, Crossroads GPS, there's Americans for Prosperity, and National Rifle Association. If you go all the way down to the bottom, the, the least amount of funds are Planned Parenthood. So think about all of these mostly conservative, um, not just conservative, but right wing efforts to ensure that certain category, certain um, candidates and certain ideas get promulgated. So what happens is what looks like grassroots really isn't. So if you just took the Koch brothers, and I know one of them has passed away, but they're still putting a lot of money into stuff. They're funding the following things. They fund the Manhattan Institute, which is where Chris Rufo was out of. They fund a bunch of anti-LGBTQ legislation. They fund a lot of anti-DEI legislation. They are funding anti-CRT legislation. They fund the Moms for Liberty. They fund anti-abortion legislation, and they have helped to fund the anti-affirmative action cases, the uh, Fisher, uh, along with Students for Fair Admission at Harvard and University of North Carolina, um, Chapel Hill. So I know my time is growing short, so I just want to make sure I um, share with you all really is not loss. Uh, the African American Policy Forum is led by uh, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw has had its third critical race theory and intersectionality um, summer school. Uh, I got a chance to teach in that summer school again this year. We had over 700 students enrolled in CRT summer school. Uh, folks like Benjamin Crump are out here on the front lines fighting back. Uh, and I also want to point out the community activists in places like Pinellas County in Florida. We say Florida as if it's the whole state. Um, but the truth of the matter is that there are some, quote, blue bubbles in this very red state. Uh, and Pinellas County, which would include places like St. Petersburg, Clearwater, uh, on the other side of Tampa, as well as Hillsborough County, somewhat where Tampa is located, have been... Uh, fighting against it. Uh, Hillsborough County, for example, has its first openly uh, gay mayor in Jane Castor. But I want to suggest to you that what really struck me about Pinellas County is that they realize that the teachers can't fight back. If you violate SB um, 7, excuse me, HB 7, which the Florida had passed as a teacher, it is a class three felony. So it's not a misdemeanor. You don't get a ticket. You now have a felony on your record and you will probably never teach again anywhere because you have to answer that question. Um, but what's happened in Pinellas County is community activists, the Urban League, NAACP, the League of Women Voters have all gotten together to fight back. If you go to a... Uh, cultural event in Pinellas County, say you go to a play or a concert, many of the the arts organizations have set up uh, book giveaways. So you go see the play and then you get a chance to um, take home with you a banned book. So while I don't think the teachers can put themselves on the line because it's their livelihood, there are community efforts and I think one of the things we may want to be thinking about is how do we build coalition so that these community efforts are amplified? 